Sean Connors, everyone. Hello, I hope you can hear me okay. I want to start just with a statement, if I can, please, if that's all right. Um, I think it's something very important. Can you, he can you hear me okay? Can you hear me now? Is that better? No, still can't hear me? Is that better? Here? Is that better? Yeah? Okay. Not used to using mics, as you can tell. Um, this statement is really important, actually. Before the truth can set you free, you need to recognize the lie that's holding you hostage. You'll often hear, my mum used to say to me that the truth sets you free, but you have to recognize the whole thing. I think that's one of the most important things. Um, the truth itself should always hold up to scrutiny. And I want to read to you verbatim something I wrote down very recently. There are those out there that get very agitated when their idea of the truth is challenged. This to me shows an internal insecurity of what they believe. If what you believe is truly true, and you 100% believe it, then it should not bother you so much what anyone says in regards to it. In fact, without testing our ideas about truth, we can never really be sure if what we believe is the truth or we've been indoctrinated, self or otherwise, in something that is not the truth or not wholly the truth. Now, my name is Sean Connors, and one of the things I need to say straight away that's very important personally is I have sex daily. No, actually, that's an anagram. <laughs> it's an anagram of actually I'm, I'm dyslexic. Now, why is that important? Why is dyslexia important to this? Well, for the first 11 years of my life, I actually didn't really understand the education system. In fact, I hid it so well that I really couldn't read or write. I didn't understand any of the times tables, none of it made any sense. And I lived in a world that, in all fairness, made absolutely no sense to me at all. And I was brilliant at hiding it. I was very clever at using the hotspots of the teachers against them. So I do all the sort of things where you go up to someone and you say, sir, I know you went to Malta. That's brilliant. Tell me about that holiday again. I really enjoyed it just to get out of maths. I was fantastic at that. Um, but these are very important things because this dyslexia, they sort of beat the uh, education system into me eventually and made me understand it. And I suppose I, I was probably open, more open to ideas because of dyslexia than I was without it. And I think this is important to mention here, very important as a person. Um, I'm not new to Flat Earth, actually. I come into it in 1999 for a number of reasons. I think it has a lot to do with my first job. I was a horticulturalist. And that job itself means that you look at things, you're out there, you're in the real world, and you see those things for what they really are. And it gets you challenging things like, you know, how does a small sapling grow against the forces of gravity? I often thought, well, how's that possible? And, you know, you, you, these things were really playing on my mind. I didn't know what it meant. I had no idea what I was looking at. I'd often see the clouds on a sunny day just stand there for hours upon end, not moving. And something in my mind told me it wasn't right. Um, you really, what I'm going to talk about today is pretty simple, actually. I'm going to cover off two things. I think one of the things that this, this conference has been fantastic for, we've had some amazing speakers. I mean, it's impossible to follow them. It really is. But I want to talk on stuff that's going to make it easy for those that are sitting on the fence, for those people that basically may have struggled with some of the concepts. And the kind of things I want to talk about is really why does the, uh, why does the, uh, what does the shape of the earth matter and why would your government lie to you? And hopefully what that will do for those that are sitting on the edge, or maybe some of the people who see this video in the future, will realise that the systems you live in are completely flawed. And you know it in your gut, actually, that the world you live in around you is seriously flawed. You know it. It will make sense to you. Somebody used in one of the slides, Sherlock Holmes, he's been a huge influence on me. He's one of the reasons I can read and write, I think. Um, you know, it's true what was said. You know, you should not be able to, you know, escape his true law, which is... Whatever, you know, no matter what it, once you eliminate the impossible, no matter what is left, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. And I really believe that. So what I'm going to do is do what Sherlock would do. And that's the obvious thing, which is to follow the money. The most important thing is to actually follow the cash, like in all things in life. So we need to follow that money. I think most people know or were brought up in my era with the fact that my mum used to say to me, the root of all evil is money. I think that's very true. Um, and if I was to stand here right now and have a £10 note in one hand and a £10 Monopoly note in the other and ask most normal people, I don't mean that with any disrespect, which one is real, um, obviously most people are going to make a stampede for my £10 note. When actually the truth is neither of them are real and money itself is not backed by anything. One of the key things a lot of people are missing nowadays is the fact that the money you hold in your pocket, if you look carefully, 
as some key words that have been removed very cleverly actually by your governments, which is the fact that in 1933 in America, they took away the gold standard from the dollar. We followed suit some years later and took away the word silver from all our banknotes. Now, if you look at your notes in your pocket, and you're welcome to do so, you'll notice those notes only say this. They say, the Bank of England promises to pay the bearer the equivalent of, but it never says what. Is that, is that gravity? Is that moon rocks? Who knows what it is? But it certainly has no real value. So what does that really make the money then? That makes your money a fiat currency. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read it verbatim, actually, what, a, what, a, what this currency actually is. A fiat money is currency without intrinsic value, established as money, often by government regulation. It has an assigned value only because the government uses its power to enforce the value of that fiat currency. Or because, and this is the big bit, exchanging parties agree to its value. That's the only reason that we exchange those values. Now, you might not think that's right, but it's actually factually true, and you can go away and research it for yourself. If you look at all the countries in the world right now, every single one of them is actually in debt. But in debt to who? Because that shouldn't make any sense. Who, who do they owe all this money to? And why are they all in this debt? They, they certainly do, yeah. Um, so who are, the real, who are the real players behind the throne here? I'm going to use the word banker, but really it should come with a silent W in front of it, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but these people are the real influence in this world. They're the people that hold all the power and the money. So if you're allowed to indulge me, I'm just going to give you their names. There's Lord Jacob de Rothschild, his son Nathaniel, Baron John de Rothschild, Sir Evelyn de Rothschild, David Rockefeller, Nathan Warburg, Henry Kissinger, George Soros, Paul Vlocker, Larry Summers, Lloyd Blankfein, and Ben Shalom. These are the guys that hold all the money. And you might think, well, are you really sure? How do you know this is true, Jean? Really, come on, be honest. Well, there's something that's come out, really, and it's something really fundamental to me. A number of people have in the past, because although I may not be new to Flat Earth, a lot of people who know me, I will say things to them. And they'll go, but how did you know? How do you know that was going to happen five years later or a few months later? How did you guess? Well, when you follow the money, it becomes really clear. And I'm going to read a little few statements out, actually. And I think this really sums it up. Before the September 11th attacks, there were only seven central banks in the world not owned by the Rothschild family. 9-11 gave them an invasion, uh, uh, give them a reason to invade the Middle East. And by 2003, Iraq and Afghanistan had established Rothschild-owned central banks. By 2011, Sudan and Libya Benghazi were also marked off the bankers' list. I'll use the silent W again. The three countries left are North Korea, Cuba, and Iran. Should make sense now, shouldn't it? You can see where the history is moving us. We don't need to be mind readers to work out the direction that's going to happen next. That tells you a lot about the money. Again, you may not believe it, and I understand that. But let's just consider something that their great-grandfather said to them. And this is Nathan Rothschild's great-grandfather. I care not what puppet is placed upon the throne of England, and I'm reading this verbatim, to the rule the empire on which the sun never sets. The man who controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control Britain's money supply. So they know full well the power that they hold, and they know full well how to use it. So I hope what that's established just in that one thing, because these are the two areas that we're going to challenge in my small speech, is that there are people out there right now who are able to pull the strings from behind the scene, because people often say, how do you know, you know, what, what difference does the shape matter, and why would your government lie? My God, they're lying to you all the time. You can even tell it in the money, can't you? You can even see it. So they're being lying to you all the way along. Now, again, you may not believe this, so you might think, well, that's, that's interesting, but there's more, because we then need to look at the systems that we grow up in. And I would talk for hours, a bit like Martin, but I couldn't do a good a job as him. But I, I th <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I want to talk about the school system, and I want to talk particularly about these points. Now, if I read these points out to you, hopefully this will make sense. So I'm going to give 10 points about the school system and our prison systems, and why they're actually the same. Um, and point six will be the only point you'll disagree with me on at the moment, but I guarantee you, like I said, in a few years' time, point six will also make sense in the UK. Both schools and prisons take away freedom. Both schools and prisons use security as a means of control. Uh, both schools and prisons, in my view, serve undesirable food. It may have improved some in the last few years, but certainly in my day it was terrible. Both schools and prisons enforce a strict dress code. Both students and prisoners attract. And if you think about it, it's obvious. 
Point six is the contentious one. Both schools and prisoners have armed guards. Now, they don't at the moment, but let me tell you something. If you just look around you, that's where it's going. There's no doubt about it. Both schools and prisoners, prisoners do not allow anger. Anger is a critical emotion that we should all examine. But it's interesting, actually, because as an unknown, boy, have I been attacked. Gary has done one of the most amazing things for me, and I really appreciate the opportunity, which is he's allowed me as an unknown to come up and talk to you on this subject. But although I hadn't got anything publicly released, I've not got any videos, I've never done anything that can easily be drawn to me, my God, I face some criticism. Incredible criticism. Um, and I think that's great, because it's like the second world pilots, really. You only face the criticism or the flack when you're nearing a target, so I suppose that's a really good thing. Um, point seven about schools and prisons, um, I was saying about not allowing anger. Point eight, both students and prisoners are forced to work. Doesn't really bring the best out of any of us, I think, when you're forced to work. Nine, both schools and prisons follow strict schedules. And point ten, both schools and prisons have a zero tolerance policy in most cases. Well, where am I going with this then? Well, I would argue this. Effectively, a school is a prison of the mind. I mean, if you consider it, it's the hardest prison to escape your mind actually. And how do you know it controls the mind? Well, let's look at something really fundamentally important. And I'm sure there's a lot of really good people out there who will know this. In the world we live in at the moment, there are a lot of words that are used. They're very cleverly used. They're used to basically subliminally message you. They're used to foreshadow events. Then they're used to control you in every facet. So when I use some of these words, I'm using them as they use them right now. The brain is made up of two hemispheres. I do apologize for using that word, but it's important here. Um, the left-hand side of the brain is the brain side that the schools absolutely push. So think about this for a moment. They push logic, accuracy, analytical skills, strategy. The control comes from their reason, and science comes from the left-hand side of the brain. Now, if you don't think that all of this matters, just take a step back for a minute and think about while you've been at this conference. And think about it in terms of if you meet someone for the first time, one of the very first things you will ever say to anybody the first time you've ever met them is, what do you do for a living? It's amazing in this country, it's amazing in this world actually, how much stock we attach to the job that we all do. Amazing amount, okay? Um, I'm constantly gobsmacked that if, we, if I said to somebody, I'm a solicitor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a surgeon, all those things are great and I admire them greatly, but it's just one side of the brain thinking, it's left side of the brain thinking. If you think about it, it's just regurgitating the facts that you've been shown. And although a surgeon may have a steady hand, in reality, it's those things. And although you may build on what has been left before, you're just repeating the facts you've been given. That's what your job is. But we attach so much stock to this. Now, if you go the other side, the right-hand side of the brain, which is where a lot of us will come from, that's all things like poetry, freedom, passion, vividness, creativeness, yearning, and all those kind of things, which we absolutely stop stoned dead in the schooling system and education system we have now. If you think you have any right or freedoms in school, to follow the path you want, you'd be very mistaken. You can't study what you want. You can't musically examine the pieces you're interested in. You can't do any of those things. So I find that one of the most telling parts of this whole process. Exams themselves have actually been getting much easier, actually. If you examine the exams when I was at school um, to where they are now, if we're honest, if we're really honest, um, they've got easier. They've got so much easier that loads of people can actually pass and go on to university. Now, when I was at school, university was a big thing. I mean, if you went to university, you were very special. And I'm not necessarily saying that was good, but it, it meant that only a few would ever go. And it wasn't always down to money because there were places for people who were naturally gifted as far as the school system was concerned. But I admired that in a strange way. I never went to university myself, but I admired it because, you know, obviously they were very good. Um, but what we've done is we've made it so easy now. And what we've tried to do is give people things like, you know, you can do a, a sports science degree and media studies. And we've made it so easy for them to get into university. Um, but at the same time, doing something very important, which I spoke about. We talked about the money. What happens when people go to university? They get into a lot of debt. They get into an absolute mountain of debt. And they basically become cash cows for the system that exists in this world right now. That's what you've got. They sap you dry before you've even begun. And so what happens, a lot of these children are coming into the world we know. They've been in a product of left brain thinking for a number of years. They come out of it with the hopes and aspirations of joining the field that interests them with zero hope of doing it. Let's be honest, very few ever do. They come out of university. I've seen it myself so many times now. People who've studied geology who come out of university. And what do they end up working in? Marks and Spencers. 
I mean, they're so far removed from the field that they're interested in, but the one difference is they've all got huge debt, which they add to the world's debt spiral that we've currently in. And the debt spiral is fairly obvious because it's heading one direction, and it's a very important debt spiral to understand because not many people will come up and make predictions that will be not nice. But the truth is, you know, history repeats itself. And the reason it keeps repeating itself is the people in charge, they don't like us, they see us as cattle. We're nothing more than fodder to them. Sheep to the slaughter. And they know what happened in the 1930s, and we're only 12 years removed from it again. You saw in 2008 a banking collapse. You will see again within 12 years another one. The sticking plaster that was put on that, we'll call it, minor collapse is only holding temporarily. It's obvious when you look at the debt that eventually the whole thing will break apart and absolutely collapse on itself. And when it does, these poor kids who have come out of school with this kind of education, which is weak at best, let's be blunt, weak at best, will have no chance to do anything other than the baseline human instinct, which is to fight over a tin of beans. They've got no ability to grow stuff, they've got no understanding of how to deal with each other, and that's one of the biggest problems. And I think one of the things that really stood out to me, I do apologise, but one of the things that really stood out to me was this quote from George Orwell, which I'm quite surprised wasn't used so far, but it may well get used. Um, obviously from his great 1984 book, which it says, the people will not revolt, they will not look up from their screens long enough to notice what's happening to them. It's actually very telling because a lot of these manuscripts are kind of history repeating itself, but it's kind of a manuscript of what's going to happen, actually. They do. They've, they always say that they're 50 years ahead of us, and I do genuinely believe that technology is 50 years ahead of where we believe it is now. Um, and I think they, they clearly know this and they set paths up. And that's a good example when I talk about money and everything else. If you look at the game of Monopoly as just one example, I talked about Monopoly money. Um, the truth of it is, is Monopoly is just really a roadmap to tell you that you're not going to own anything and the banks are always going to own it for you. So just get used to it. So I've touched on hopefully what I've done for those that are sitting in the audience and actually thinking, okay, yeah, I get that, where you're going from. He's talked about, he's talked about what it's like um, in terms of money and hopefully clarified it enough so people can see what is actually happening and start to realise that your government's aligned to you. Your education system is controlling you. It's not giving you any real freedoms. And then we look at the people that are coming into this world, the youth. And the youth are the most important people. And here's a really telling fact. This is currently the generation of the most depressed and suicidal youth under 25 so that's ever existed at any time period. And the question simply is why? And most of them struggle with that. They blame all sorts of things. You have to just think for a moment that nothing represents them. Look what's happened to music and art. What is music now? It used to mean something. Back in my day, we had groups of music that, and I'm not saying, hey, granddad, get off my grass, but what I mean by this is very simply, you had music that represented that youth movement at that time. It was real, it was theirs, and it was something they could really hold to and actually fight against the system. I don't even want to talk about the modern music that we've actually got. This is what represents the youth today. I'm quite worried for them, actually. And then we talk about art. Really? Um, millions of pounds on pieces of baboon art, and that's okay. And that represents us as a culture, so when we look back in 100 years' time at this generation, and that's the art movement and the music that you've got that represents you, my God, you should be depressed. I'm not surprised. But you're not depressed just because of those things. Keanu Reeves said this, and this really stuck with me. The truth is, you don't struggle with depression. You struggle with the reality you live in. That's the problem you have. Now, there's another thing that was quite interesting as well, is that I did quite a lot of research on this, and I had to really make sure I clarified things before I spoke about it. A lot of research has been done in multiple countries. I worry about research, because I think you have to be careful whatever you read about. But this point was really true, and they couldn't understand it, so these are the scientists can't get this. They said, why is the human brain shrinking? Why has it started shrinking? Well, look at all the crap that you've been feeding it over the last 40 years. Look at the rubbish that is going in. You wonder why the kids are ill, depressed. Look at the food. Look at everything around you. Look at the air. Look at the qualities. And you wonder why. You look at us. You look at me and you say, flat earth is crazy. You need to look at the world that you actually live in. That's the crazy part. Thank you. I want to repeat something. It was touched on by Martin, but I want to repeat this because I want to read it verbatim because this is very important. This was Joseph Goebbels wrote this about the German military machine. And there's some key words that are really used in this. It's very important. 
If you tell a lie big enough and you keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can only be maintained for such a time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic or military consequences of the lie. This is very important, this. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to represent dissent, for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus by extension the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. And you wonder why you're attacked? That's why. That's the reason. I want to give you a conclusion. I had to write it down because I had to think very carefully what I wanted to say as a final piece, why this matters so much. So hopefully what I've done in this small speech for those sitting on the fence has got you realizing one thing. Whatever you believe about the flat earth or whatever you think, you can't be happy with the systems you currently live in. You should be questioning everything that they're saying to you. And I've got a very simple way of actually doing this. It works brilliantly, actually. When anybody important ever says to me, Sean, you need to do this. I believe the opposite because it's closer to the truth. And amazingly, how many times I've been proved right. So when I've taken a stance on global warming, I've been proved right. When I took a stance on stupid, let's change the diesel, I said they'll be changing that back in 20 years. Well, they've been changing that back. It's amazing. You'll be amazed at how many people suddenly say, how did you know? How were you right? How could you tell it was going to be true? Because they've been lying to you all this time. Now, I want to end this way. What happens when you reach the point I'm at, and I've been really in this movement really since 99, what happens to you when you come out of this? Well, I think if everybody reached the point we were at, or at the point that I'm at, this is what would happen. It would be the end of power-hungry greed in this world. It would be the end of egos and materialism. It would be the end of separation and judgment. It would be the end of control and fear. It would actually be the end of wars and unnecessary death. It would be the end of lies and deception. It would be the end of hate and true cruelty, the end of slavery, because you are all slaves, you're debt slaves, we're all debt slaves, we're all in the cogs of the hamster wheel. It would be the beginning of unity, this. The beginning of compassion, the beginning of trust, the beginning of equality, the beginning of love, and to be perfectly honest, the beginning of life. Thank you very much. what was said by Arthur Conan Doyle's creation Sherlock Holmes, one of my great inspirations actually. And he says if you eliminate the probable, no matter what is left, no matter how improbable, it must be the truth. Follow us on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter.